January 8, 1992, interview with Jan Meyer. Okay. Um, this will be put on in the Kansas State Historical Society archives. And if you wish to back up and change anything, you know, if you say something, we'll also allow you to do that. We erase tapes and things <laughs> to correct things to make this okay. Uh, when did you serve in the Kansas legislature? What years? I was a member uh, of the Kansas Senate uh, from 1972 to 1984. Okay. And uh, you were always just in the House, in the Senate. You never were in the House. Or That's you right. I, was, the House. I uh, served on the Overland Park City Council uh, for five years and went directly from the City Council to the Kansas Senate. Okay. Now, you, you are a Republican. Can you tell us why you're a Republican or did something? Well, there's, uh, yeah, I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, although the difference in the parties is not in, enormous. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of areas, when um, the decision as to what individuals are going to do who are elected, is usually made by focusing on that particular set of circumstances at that particular time. And so a lot of times very pragmatically, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you might act in somewhat the same way. But there are some very basic, I, I think, differences between the parties. And, um, and oh, the major one being that uh, the Republicans the Democrats believe, I think, in a very large central government in Washington. And uh, they believe in raising the taxes to pay for it. And the Republicans believe in a, a more decentralized government with more things being handled, with as much as possible being handled at the local and the state level, and as little as possible in the large federal government. And they, I think, believe that if you can handle things in the private area or through local or state government, that you should raise uh, as little taxes as possible. Mm -hmm. Just they believe in a smaller, more decentralized government. And I believe the uh, he governs best who governs least. And I believe the best government is the government closest to home. And so I guess that's the principal mm -hmm. reason. Now, uh, have you always the been other the other major difference that I have noticed just over the years? I didn't go in with this um, uh, idea, but the difference that I have noted over the years is that on labor management issues, um, the Republicans, uh, you know, if you're thinking of the pendulum, the, re the Republicans would swing slightly toward business and the Democrats would sl swing slightly toward labor. But I don't think that's really terribly rigid, and I don't think it's a dramatic one way or the other. It depends a lot on your district and who mm -hmm. you represent. Mm -hmm. Well, have you always been a Republican? Uh, yes. I, first I, my parents were Republican. Okay. I grew up in a Republican household. My father was an editor, and my mother was active in the community. And um, I... Um, while I would say that they were probably both more like what we would call independents today. They were very independent in their thinking. Still, basically, they were very Republican. Mm -hmm. and okay. That's interesting. Uh, can you describe your first election to the Kansas Senate to us? Uh, what made you decide to run? And, uh, when did you decide to run? What, what? I was a member of the Overland Park City Council and had, um, uh, was in the middle of a three-year term, I think it was. And uh, because of population changes, the legislature redrew the Senate, uh, state Senate lines, and I lived in an empty, in a vacant oh. district. And so uh, a number of people said to me, you really ought to run for that uh, state Senate seat. There was a House member that I highly regarded that also lived in the Senate seat, and I talked to him and said, are you interested in running for that Senate position? And he said no. Uh, he was going to be Chairman of Ways and Means in the following year in the House, and he said, I 
would rather stay in the house where I am, and so I said, well, if you don't, then I am. And so uh, that's how that decision was made. I um, um, <clears throat> started uh, in government, really, uh, as a volunteer, and I worked for uh, years, during the years when my children were growing up, uh, in the League of Women Voters. I was president of the League of Women Voters in Johnson County. Um, in um, United Community Services, um, which is the United Way agency, planning agency in Johnson County, in the Mental Health Association, um, in the effort to establish a community college in uh, Johnson County, and in water resource areas. And in all of those volunteer areas that I worked in, as well as the city council, it seemed to me that um, the, the way you could address so many problems was in the state legislature. And so really, I had always been interested, but that's when that decision was made. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, did you decide to run early uh, that year, or did you wait till the post the filing um, deadline? Or? No, I, um, you know, I'm having a hard time remembering exactly, but um, I made the decision um, fairly early on. I think closing filing date was uh, June 20th, and I don't think I filed until late, but I think I announced um, in February or so oh. because um, if if I was elected, it it would mean that I would be leaving the uh, city council, and I wanted to give people plenty of time, plenty of notice. But it seems to me like it was in the in the early spring, maybe February, that mm -hmm. I announced for the Senate, and then of course closing filing date was in June. Um, I had a very, very tough primary election, mm -hmm. uh, not such a tough uh, general election. In fact, the, um, the man who ran against me in the general said that if I had been the only candidate, he would not have filed. Mm -hmm. But he was filing because he was unhappy with my opponent in the primary so that if the other man would have won in the primary, he wanted okay. to be there to oppose him. But he said, you know, if, uh, if Jan wins, I probably won't make much of a campaign out of it. Mm. And so once the primary was passed, um, I, um, I mean, he followed through for his party and he went through the motions, but his, he, he personally was not dedicated to the idea. Mm. So I did not have it a terribly difficult um, general election, but a very tough primary. Mm. Why was the primary so tough? Um, there were uh, some issues um, uh, at stake that um, some of them had developed when I was on the city council. Uh, I think that uh, we had gone through a very fast development a period in Overland Park, a very rapid development period. And um, I had, oh, I believe in progress, and I am very supportive of business, I, as is witnessed by my business record ever since I was in the state Senate and, and in Congress, I am very supportive of business. But I believe also that um, when you are in the middle of a residential community, and the principal business activity at that time was commercial, and office development, that you have to regulate and control that development thinking in terms of the surrounding homeowners, and you have to be very respectful of your residential uh, development. Consequently, some of the developers, not all of them by any means, but some of the developers uh, said uh, she's anti-business and has an anti-development record. Uh, but it turned out not to be a major issue, but that was the issue that was um, hmm. that was used fairly heavily in that campaign. Abortion was also an issue, hmm. uh, although it it hadn't uh, raised its head uh, very much as an issue yet. Kansas 
uh, already had a, uh, a very strong law on the books. Uh, prior Roe v. Wade, I think, uh, in 1969, um, a law was put into place in Kansas that said um, that um, abortions could only be formed, performed uh, in the state of Kansas to save the life of the mother in case of serious uh, physical or mental illness in case of serious malformation of the fetus um, and um, that you and that abortions had to be performed in a licensed facility by someone licensed by the Board of Healing Arts and that um, no one could be forced to take part in an abortion if it was against their uh, religious conscience so that uh, this protected hospital employees who may not want to participate. So it was it, it was a law that had worked and worked fairly well. It had been on the books I think since 68. This was now 72. Therefore abortion really hadn't raised itself to the level uh, that it did after Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. After Roe v. Wade it became more of a national issue. Um, and But still, at that time, that was one difference between us. I, I, I believed and supported reproductive freedom for women, and, and he did not, and it did become an issue. Mm. Mm. Well, who encouraged you to run that first time? Uh, mostly it was, um, I think it was, there were some party people, and there were some um, uh, constituents in my uh, ward in Overland Park that, you know, had liked the way I'd represented them on the city council and said, why don't, you should, you should do that. Um, and then I will say that from some of the elected officials, I also uh, got some encouragement. They, they were careful not to take part in a primary, uh, of course because they were going to have to serve with whoever won. Mm -hmm. But um, people like um, uh, Robert Bennett and, um, and Wendell Lady and those people that I had known and worked with for a long time were encouraging and said, you know, mm -hmm. go for it. Mm -hmm. Well, who campaigned for you? Now, you mentioned some organizations that you had participated in. Mm -hmm. uh, were they the backbone of your campaign workers? Um, well, th mostly um, it, the, those individuals in those organizations, of course, had to campaign as individuals. They, mm -hmm. the organizations, none of those nonprofit um, bipartisan groups could support me as an organization. But an awful lot of individuals in those groups, uh, yes, mm -hmm. did support me. A mental Health Association, League of Women Voters, United Community Services, the, com the whole community college effort, hmm. um, and, and as I say, the business community also uh, was supporting. There were some who, um, who were not happy with me, but uh, I would say the majority of the business community thought I had done a good job. And so it was, um, but my opponent was, had been uh, the mayor of Miriam, and he had been a county commissioner, and he had substantial political support. And mm -hmm. so it was divided. It was not easy uh, by any mm -hmm. means. It was a very hard-fought campaign, and he was a hard campaigner, and his family campaigned for him hard. And so it, I, I won by a, a large margin, oh, but did. I don't think any of the polls you know, we didn't do any polling, but, you know, sometimes the newspapers mm -hmm. will do both. I don't think any of those uh, locally done polls indicated that the margin was going to be as great as it was. But as it turned out, I got about two-thirds of the vote. Mm. I think it was 60, 62 percent <laughs> or huge. something. That's huge. 62 or 64 yeah. percent, I think. Oh, that's, that's great. Well, how did you campaign that first time, and do you still campaign the same way, probably? Um, 
very much uh, the same way, except that now we have to use a lot more uh, electronic media mm -hmm. because we cover uh, such a big base. But that time, uh, we used some radio, uh, newspapers, um, large signs, eight by eights, um, and yard signs, and um, door hangers, and uh, and door to door. Now, you, you're you're familiar familiar enough with campaigning to know that. What you're talking about is a tremendous number of volunteers. Yes, especially in the Senate district. <laughs> yes, yes, a lot of volunteers because I think maybe I campaigned in that first Senate race with I don't know maybe two thousand dollars. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, two thousand dollars. I think so. In in fact, the most I ever spent in campaigning for um, the Kansas Senate was. Uh, my last year there, and uh, for I let's see, I guess I ran in um, eighty to eighty four. That was right. Mm -hmm. I, the last mm -hmm. time I ran was in eighty for the Kansas Senate, and I think at that time I might have spent um, six thousand hmm. dollars on that race. So I it was not it. I I had campaigned um, a lot with volunteers. And I've always had trouble raising money. I don't quite know why. Really? Always my next trouble. question was going to be, how, <laughs> oh. how did you raise your money? <laughs> well, that that first year, I think um, I s took about a thousand from um, my own resources and, and raised about a thousand in the community just from talking to friends and hmm. mostly it was probably in 2550. Just small you know, smaller smaller amounts. But that is st still a problem. It remains a problem with me really? today. And I would say that the other legislators in Kansas, all f there are five of us now, mm -hmm. and four are men and then me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I would say probably all four of them have ten times as much money in the bank right now as I do. My goodness. Uh, it, it really is very odd. It is very mm. odd. So. Um, and I don't know quite what the difference is because I work pretty hard mm -hmm. at raising money, and um, but that's the way it goes, and that's the way it has always been with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just kind of uh, I do with what I have, and it's always been enough. Mm -hmm. So, well, we had a, uh, some other women that have said that that maybe it was harder because you're a woman. Do you think that's a possibility? Um, well, it's that. Uh, it's somewhat that. It's somewhat that um, I I am very very respectful of my constituents, hmm. but I do try to. Um, I think that's one of our tables. Oh, well, let me just hear it. Yeah. Oh no, that's perfectly oh, all right. Perfect. Now mine. Turn yours off and let's see if mine. Okay. Yeah, that's strange. Maybe. And when I stopped it, it didn't. Well, that's. Try to turn the table and see if that. Yeah, why don't we see? It might be the tape rather than. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Very <laughs> good. Now the squeak has stopped. <laughs> well, but it has to do with the. Um, with I think uh, the style of. Um, of the legislator, something about the personality of the legislator. I talked to a longtime friend uh, the other night, and he said, uh, he said, Jan, I got your letter, your fundraising letter, and he says, do you really need money? And I said, Bob, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I would, <laughs> I would have written it. He says, yeah, but you always win. And I said, oh. the problem is, Bob, that if you have no money in the bank at all, um, then you actually really kind of invite opposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, so I don't want to build such a big war chest that I look foolish, like I'm trying to stave off any opposition mm -hmm. whatsoever. On the other hand, 
to go into an election year with ten thousand dollars in the bank is ridiculous and mm -hmm. and it means that people think perhaps you're not even serious about running and so I said yes I do I do have to have some money mm -hmm. and he says well you probably won't need it and I said you know this is a highly competitive mm -hmm. district almost every district is now and um, so anyone can come out of the blue if even if they have never held office and if they are credible at all uh, mount a, a serious campaign and they'll get 40 percent of the vote mm -hmm. now that means there's 10 percent down and 10 percent mm -hmm. <laughs> here and and if um, well, 40% is just not very far from 51% is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And and any person who holds public office who doesn't raise money and work at it is asking to be defeated. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you can overdo it. I think sometimes people end up with a million and a half dollars in the bank, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but I think um, if you are not prepared to mount a serious campaign uh, by, say, June or July of an election year, you better, you hmm. better forget it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, now, in your elections, uh, how has the media treated you? Have they endorsed you and supported oh, you? Oh, the media has been very good to me, mm -hmm. very good to me over the years. That doesn't mean that they don't really take me to task when they disagree <laughs> with. Uh, with what I'm doing, and I'm fairly thin-skinned about that. I think it's because <laughs> I've been fairly spoiled. They've agreed with me most of the time, so that when they disagree with me and do uh, a tough story or a critical editorial, um, I just feel like somebody shot me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I complain and carry on and try to convince them I'm right. And, uh, so, but um, I would say they have been, uh, they've been very good to me most of the time it's because they have agreed with what I'm doing and um, but and they've endorsed me on the editorial mm -hmm. page. Yeah. Did a, had a relative or a close friend of yours run for either the House or the Senate prior to you your running? Is anyone in any of your family? Uh, let's or? see. I think I had an uncle once um, by marriage in Nebraska who ran for the state legislature. Uh, he was defeated, but um, there was there was that family connection with um, politics. But um, he was an uncle I was not particularly close to either geographically. In, in, you know, yeah. I. So, but that's the only family member that I am aware of at all that has the remotest interest in running for office. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. Okay, and. Uh, has your district, during the time that you were in the Kansas Senate, did your district change dramatically, or uh, what was your district, mainly Overland Park, and a business area, or residential? Uh, it did change. When I was first elected, I had North Overland Park, well, I had most of Overland Park. Uh, I live uh, on 90th Street, and I was right at the southern part of the district. I had most of uh, Overland Park, all of Miriam, and half of Mission. And then the next time we redrew the lines, I got moved south so that then my district lay entirely within the city of Overland Park, and mm. it was virtually all of Overland Park. Mm. I was thinking that, but I couldn't, couldn't remember. Um, what issues then, if, if this is your district, what issues are, are they most interested in and have been? Uh, has that changed over the years? Are you talking about uh, now or are you talking about when I was in the Kansas in the Senate? Ca when you were in the Kansas Senate. Okay. When I was in the Kansas Senate, I would say that the issue that I heard the most about uh, was, um, was education. Mm -hmm. uh, the, oh, I was on the education committee and um, and distribution of school finance money has always been an enormously difficult um, uh, issue for Kansas. However, I will say that Kansas addressed it very, very early. We, in the late 
60s, early 70s, they began to fall in line with a Supreme Court decision from California and Texas that said that education was a state responsibility and that there had to be some equalizing so that if you lived in a very poor district where you could levy a hundred mills and still not have enough money to run a good school district, you had, the state had to do something to equalize that with a district over here that could raise 10 mills and, and have more than enough money for their school district. And so we did start to work with equalization. And the problem was that I think then it became kind of um, an almost a punitive thing to Johnson County. Mm -hmm. Rather than equalizing and uh, Johnson County uh, had, even at that time, it had a fairly high mill levy uh, because it was growing so fast that we had to build a new school building every year. So it wasn't like we had a real low levy like Burlington down mm -hmm. in Coffee mm -hmm. County or anything. But, but we were probably not the highest in the state. And I don't think anybody here objected to some equalization. But then they kind of turned the Supreme Court decision almost on its ear, and the wealthier counties were paying the highest mill levy in the state. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. And because they based it on income tax uh, and, and withheld school money looking at your income tax, uh, records or your your per capita income, and um, they it it got so that it was very punitive, not just to Johnson County but to Wichita, mm -hmm. because those are the two uh, districts with fairly high per capita income, I guess, and and they based it partially on property tax, par partially on. Uh, on per capita income, but it was quite punitive to Johnson County. And then in later years, it became, I mean, <laughs> Johnson County was absolutely a target. And so it was something we fought about rather badly. Uh, we, um, and, but each year we would come to some kind of a resolution and it would get worked out. But it was the one thing that <coughs> was extremely difficult mm -hmm. for us every year, and it's still being very difficult mm. for us. The reason it's so difficult is because you, when you look at how much money a district has, you don't take into account several other things. One, the desires of that district. Some district may be le raising a lower mill levy because they don't put the same value on education mm -hmm. as another district does. Uh, every district values education, but it is a matter of priorities. Just how much do you want to spend on this? The other thing is they were not looking at um, the number of children in the schoolroom, the uh, pupil-teacher hmm. ratio. It was a factor in the formula, but it was not addressed. For instance, if you, if you say everybody has to raise the same levy, and then we'll compensate for the money, you might end up with 35 kids in a classroom here and 10 kids in a classroom here. And somehow, um, Shawnee Mission, in order to address the large number of pupils that we were dealing with, um, we ended up, well, all the years I was in the legislature with the highest mill levy in the state, mm -hmm. or most of the years I was in, not always. Sometimes Wichita was higher. Uh, we so it was a struggle. I don't think anybody really, uh, you know, nobody was being evil. They were just um, doing the best they could for their constituents in what was a very sensitive issue. Another very difficult issue we dealt with was the severance tax when I was there, and that was probably the most uh, difficult issue in terms of personal relationships. People who had been good friends for a long time. <laughs> sort of mm -hmm. stopped speaking to each other. I was glad that we resolved that issue in in uh, 83 and that I could go back for 
or maybe it was 82, and I could go back for another couple of sessions because <laughs> I, it reminded me how much fun the legislature was. Because for a year or two there, when we were dealing with the severance tax, believe me, it was not fun. Mm -hmm. It was it was strained and difficult, um, and uh, the stresses were not along party lines; they were along geographic lines for the most part. Some party involved. And um, then um, the, always the regulatory issues are difficult in the legislature. Uh, regulation of of everything from uh, businesses to um, uh, farms to nursing homes. Mm -hmm. All of the regulatory issues were difficult. And I was chairman of um, public health and welfare, and uh, so we had the issue of clean water, and we had the issue of clean air, and we had the issue of regulation of, of, of nursing homes, child care facilities, uh, all of those um, uh, sorts of health and welfare issues. And so I enjoyed it very much, but it was difficult, mm -hmm. difficult to me. Mm -hmm. Well, how would you describe your positions on these issues? Are you a liberal? Are you a conservative? Are you something else? Now, you get to use your own well, label here. Well, I, um, I think I'm fiscally quite conservative. Mm -hmm. And on all other issues, I would say I am probably a moderate. Uh, I think that I'm, I'm a very strong environmentalist, for one thing. But even in environmental issues, I think you have to work um, with, uh, with the business community in order to be realistic about how you set up the regulations. And so I think I am a pragmatic moderate on other issues, and I'm a fiscal conservative. <laughs> That sounds good. Uh, now, you mentioned that you were chairman of the Health and Welfare Public Health and Welfare. Uh, what other committee assignments did you have? I was vice chairman of transportation, which I enjoyed tremendously. Highways uh, and transportation issues are enormously important to, well, everybody in the United States, but they are particularly important in a very fast-growing uh, county, and so I was very glad to be on that committee. I was on the uh, education committee uh, up until the last four years, and then I moved to. Um, I was also chairman of uh, local government. See, because I was there for three yeah. different sessions. It sounds like I'm on all these committees, but, but you're on different ones. Different sure. ones. Um, the one consistent one throughout was public health and welfare, and I was both vice chairman and chairman of that, I think, all the time that I was there. Uh, I was uh, on the education committee for eight years and was chairman of some of the interim committees during the mm -hmm. summer because, of course, the Kansas legislature then, and I believe still, is in full session from about mid-January to mid-April. And then they take about a month's break. And then from um, mid-May until mid-October, they meet in interim committees. And depending on the number of interim committees that you're on, you could be in Topeka one or two days a week mm -hmm. all throughout that interim. And then everybody goes home and starts giving speeches uh, <coughs> to tell people what, what the legislature will probably do so that everybody can be a little prepared and then we go back into session again in January. So it sounds, you know, when you describe the job to people, it sounds as if it's just January yeah. through April. But really, um, it's it's uh, almost an 18-hour-a-day job January through April, and then it's at least a half-time job almost all mm -hmm. the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. That's really true. Mm -hmm. Now, as a freshman legislator, did you have a mentor? Did you have uh, someone that helped you and helped you get these committee assignments and everything? I would say that um, I always had people who were who were helpful to me. But the fact that when I went over there, Bob Bennett, uh, Robert Bennett uh, mm -hmm. from Johnson County, um, was president of the Senate, and I ha <coughs> I had worked with him on. Um, in local government, 
we oh. had kind of, our paths were quite parallel, really, mm. except Bob was a few years ahead of me. But he'd been mayor of Prairie Village. I'd been president of the council, of the city council, which is kind of a vice mayor mm -hmm. position in Overland Park. Uh, he'd been president of the League of Kansas Municipalities, and I had also. Hmm. Um, I think I think I was the first woman president of um, of my city council. Well, no, I was the first woman president of my city council, and the first woman president of the League of Kansas Municipalities, and the first woman president of the Mid America Regional Council. Hmm. That's and. I believe, I, I'm just sure I was the first elected woman on the book board of directors of the National League of Cities. Hmm. And I think Bob Bennett had also s served on the board of directors of the National League of Cities, but that had been several years before I got there. At any rate, um, our, our paths had been quite par parallel, and I had known Bob well over the years. And um, so, and he was president of the Senate. Norman Gar was there at the time, and uh, I think he was on. Uh, I think he was on. Well, I'm, I, I think they had a committee at that time that decided who got which committee yeah. assignments. Yeah, I think. I can't remember whether that was started that year with Bob Bennett or four years later, but at any rate, I think Norman Gar was there and was a member of that committee. Uh, that decided who got which committee assignments. So I had some help, all right, and uh, both of those people were friends and are friends of mine to this day. Um, when the lady was in the house, and he and I had served on the Overland Park City Council together, uh, and uh, had had been good friends, are still to this day. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of help. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just answered my next question, which was about the power structure in the House and Senate. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do that again. Did well, you? Wendell went on. Uh, he was president. He was chairman of Ways and Means when I got there uh, in the House, and then um, he went on to become Speaker of the House, of course. And um, by that time, Bob Bennett was governor. And um, Dick Rogers was president of the Senate, and when he left, uh, it became uh, Ross Doyen mm -hmm. of Concordia. So I served uh, under three different presidents sure. of the Senate, which was kind of interesting <laughs> uh -huh, because uh -huh. prior to my getting there, in fact, one of the first uh, one of the first sessions of the Senate that I went to, they were giving Glee Smith of Larned an award because he had been president of the Senate for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And so when Bob was elected president, I thought, well, I'll probably serve my mm -hmm. years in the Senate under Bob Bennett. But of course, he was only there two years, and then he was elected governor. And so in my 12 years, I had three, three, three different, different people. That's, that's kind of unusual. Um, Oh, there are three or four major uh, issues, debates, controversies, or victories that you remember particularly well from uh, oh, yes. your... <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I would say that um, there, were some, there were some issues that um, I may have been a, a little out in front on because of my work with the Mental Health Association and United Community Services, and I really spearheaded them. And they were kind of new issues, I think, actually, when they, uh, once they were adopted, they were very accepted. And it sounds like motherhood and apple pie, and who would oppose that? But they were very tough issues. And the first was um, I substantially expanded um, the Kansas law on child abuse and neglect. It was, it had been simply a kind of a one-liner almost that if a doctor saw a case of child abuse and neglect um, that um, it should be reported to the authorities. And we expanded that tremendously because frequently uh, physicians uh, don't see cases of child abuse and neglect, but other professionals do. 
and frequently the physician doesn't like to be a, I mean, he sees himself as a helping person and not as a law enforcement person, and so he needed I, I felt like just putting it all on the physician was too much. And we, with the strong support of all of the organizations involved, expanded that to include nurses, daycare workers, teachers, uh, anybody in the law enforcement community or the social service community. We said that anybody who maliciously and falsely uh, reported a case of child abuse and neglect um, could be uh, punished for it. We um, said um, that the social service workers across state lines could exchange information so that if someone um, was a child abuser in one state and was reported, they could convey that information to another state. We we really uh, expanded the Child Abuse and Neglect Act tremendously, and uh, when it passed in the Senate, it passed almost unanimously, but I was on my feet for three hours debating oh, that. Goodness. And, and the, the unusual questions, does this mean, um, out, of, out of the fact that it was fairly new uh, subject at the time in 1972, um, and people would say, well, does this mean that if I spank my child that somebody can come in mm -hmm. and say I'm guilty of child abuse and neglect? And, of course, you have to put those fears to rest and say, we're, you know, we're not talking about spanking here. We're, we're talking about broken bones. We're talking mm -hmm. about serious neglect of children that is not being addressed. Um, we set up the system whereby uh, you could, uh, under what circumstances can you remove a child from a home temporarily? Under what circumstances must you sever, sever those parental um, uh, relationships? And so it was a rather extensive law and a difficult one. Um, the other early one was um, one of my bills for the first time uh, put state support into community mental health centers and community-based services and facilities for retarded individuals. Mm. And uh, that was a very dramatic change because up until that time, uh, we had only put state money into state facilities. And of course, there was a lot of protection there of state facilities. And I said, I don't want to destroy the state facilities. I think it has to be both and and not either or, but I think putting all people into state facilities who need any kind of help with um, a mental health problems or with, um, with problems of mental retardation is, um, is not an appropriate thing to do. There had been some federal money. But uh, the federal money was running out, and everybody knew it was not going to be uh, renewed, and it was time uh, that we had some state support. And of course, and the first year I passed it, uh, that was a very difficult bill to get passed, both because of political pressures from uh, state hospitals and it, a whole variety of, of reasons. But it was, so it was a difficult bill. Anytime you make substantial changes in the way you've always done things, it's going to be difficult. Yeah. And um, so one of the people in the Senate said to me, okay, you finally got your bill, but you're only going to get, um, I think it was, um, two hundred. I can't remember exactly what it was. 200,000 for mental health and 200,000 for mental retardation. Mm -hmm. And that's all you're going to get. And I said, that's all right. It'll grow. Mm -hmm. And of course now I think that must be a 12 to 15 million dollar yeah. annual bill because there are so many people who are being treated in the community. Mm -hmm. so that's 
major, major. And, and then one of the last ones, of course, that was one of the most difficult, was just a, a almost a complete rewriting of the <laughs> laws on driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, and this was in, um, this was done in 83, and that was certainly one of the hardest mm -hmm. bills, because there was a lot of a lot of objection mm -hmm. to it. The attorneys didn't like it. I, and you know, I can understand they, they see this as, you know, from their client's point of view, frequently, not wanting to get a law so rigid that it's it's punitive to people. Mm -hmm. But really, what I saw was a a law that had grown up and been amended over the years until it uh, it was just. Uh, impossible. Um, it was an impossible law. We, uh, and so the bill toughened penalties and tightened up the procedure. The procedural part of the bill was what w was really just terrible. Um, <laughs> for instance, if you were arrested for, <laughs> under the old law, if you were arrested for drunk driving in Salina, it set forth in the law that the hearing had to be in the county of residence. So that meant the hearing was in Johnson County, and the arresting officer had to be present. So that, I mean, you'd have had policemen running all over the state. Consequently, everybody was walking out the door, and nobody was, was, uh, was receiving any kind of uh, punishment for drunk driving. Even, even the repeaters. And so in the law, we not only toughened the penalties, we tightened the procedures. We made it possible to intervene early in the disease of alcoholism. And, and we know that drunk driving frequently is a, a problem of alcoholism because even we know statistically, or did at the time, I don't know what the statistics say now, but statistically at the time, if you, if you arrested someone for drunk driving and it was his first arrest, chances are he had been driving that way uh, 200 times. Mm -hmm. Once or twice a week for a year or two. He had been drunk driving 200 times, statistically. Mm -hmm. And so um, we made provisions in the law for a first offender because you have to for that once in a thousand times when that person really is a first offender. So we made provision in the law for the first offender, but we knew there weren't very many of them because it is frequently a problem of alcoholism. And so we um, made some provisions for getting some people some help at early stages. Okay. Uh, there was one, you were the only woman for how many years in that? I think it was six years I was the only yeah, woman, sorry. and then I think um, Nancy Parrish came mm -hmm. in um, 78, didn't she? I think it was 80. 80, okay. Then I was the only woman for eight years. So you were the only woman until Nancy Parrish. When until that Nancy okay. Parrish. I think that's right. And then Nancy Parrish came, and uh, Norma from Wichita, and Jane Eldridge from Lawrence. So that I was all alone for six or eight years, and then it was Nancy and me for mm -hmm. um, a couple of years. And then the last, that's why I was thinking that Nancy came in 78 or well, 79. Well, maybe, maybe she did, but we found it in some newspaper clipping, I thought that said 80, but that, you yeah. may be right. And then I think Norma and Jane were elected mm -hmm. in 80, so mm -hmm. that my last four years, there were four of us there, and that was, it was fun to have mm -hmm. some. Did that make a big difference? Well, I, I think it did. It's um, actually, uh, the men were very good to me. I mean, mm -hmm. I got good committees. My bills all passed. They all came up on the calendar. Um, uh, you know, even when the president of the Senate wasn't very fond of a bill that I was raising, he always gave me my chance to raise it. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I had very good luck with with legislation. I, I remember one year, I think I passed 12 or 13 bills mm -hmm. that I had introduced under my name. Some of them were just little narrow bills to mm -hmm. 
to correct a small problem, but some of them were big sweeping bills like uh, mm. the drunk driving changes or the or or the child abuse and neglect act change. Uh, so the men were very good to me, but the problem was if you're the only individual um, uh, that is a, a woman, if you are different in any way, you are <laughs> you always feel <laughs> sort of like uh, you're a sore thumb there. I, I always felt very visible. And mm -hmm. so it was nice when then there were two women and when there were four, it was even better because you don't feel quite so, um, quite so much like you're um, so highly visible. I, I don't know how else to explain it because I never really felt isolated. I always felt like one of the group in there. I never felt like one of the guys. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think that's very important to feel like one of the mm -hmm. guys. I, I do think it's important to feel like one of the group, and I always did. Well, uh, of course, Audrey Langworthy says they didn't get the bathroom in there, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They, I mean, they, they didn't. Uh, I mean, I, I had to walk clear across the hall, you know. And if you're in the middle of a five-hour session, sooner or later you're going to have to get up and leave. <laughs> and, and so that was inconvenient. There's yeah. no question about it. And besides that, um, if there was a particularly uh, difficult bill, and you were in the middle of a session and you had to get up and walk across the hall outside, you're liable to get stopped 15 times mm -hmm. on the way by people who want to talk to you about this bill you're going to be working on in there. So it, it's, uh, it was inconvenient, but that was all. Mm -hmm. What well, was it, 86 or something when they finally... It was after I left. Yeah, finally. Did I know it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't done in 84. <laughs> I know that. Okay. When you... Um, you, you ended your legislative service by deciding to run for the U.S. Congress. Uh, well, actually, um, I had decided uh, be before that. I, I knew that I was not going to run again because mm -hmm. I had enjoyed it. I still enjoyed it, and that's the way I wanted to leave it. I, and I, while I don't necessarily believe in term limitations. I do think that a person should make their contribution and then move on and let mm -hmm. somebody else make their contribution. And um, as I say, I was leaving while I still enjoyed it. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. So um, I had decided not to run again in 84. And I was just going to stay home and grow roses or get a job. In fact, I already had got a job here mm -hmm. in, in the community, but only only a very few people knew I wasn't going to run because I didn't want to announce it yet because I didn't want to be a lame duck that mm -hmm. last three months. And so I thought, you know, they'll they'll find out at the end. Then, in I think it was November, uh, Larry Wynn, my predecessor in Congress, announced that he was not going to run again. I began thinking about it right away. Um, and it, it did take some soul-searching on my part because I really had looked forward mm -hmm. to not being in government and to having a nine-to-five job like other people and not having to run for office every four years and so forth. And so it was almost like changing my whole mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, but some people said to me, do run, and it looked like a good opportunity, and so I thought about it a lot and talked to my family, of course. And in the last weekend in January, I announced that I would run for Congress. I think I remember that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, uh, those are the questions we were going to ask you. Now, there's one other thing I think we need to address here before I get to talking about your political mm -hmm. life at the, in the Kansas uh, Senate. Uh, we've noticed that in 1974 that um, uh, something happened to change the numbers of women that were being elected in the Kansas House. Prior to that time, there had never been more than four. Uh -huh. And all I of a know. sudden, the, the number started growing, and it's been growing ever since. Can you, uh, and that sort of happened in 80, I think, in, in the Senate. Can you identify what that something is that caused this to happen? I think, uh, well, first, you have to say that Kansas is very accepting and encouraging of women who run mm -hmm. for office. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to mention that we, we have set all kinds of records in Kansas yeah. for, as far as women are concerned. I represented the first district in the United States in, in all of history that was represented in Congress by a woman in both the House and the Senate. That had never happened before mm -hmm. until I was elected in, um, uh, in 84. And of course, Nancy Kassebaum was in the Senate. And so when I was elected, that meant that the third district in Kansas had a rather unique place in history. But if you go back to the beginning where you're talking about, I mean, we were one of the first states to ratify um, women's right to vote. We were one of the first ones to elect a woman mayor. We, I mean, it, we've had a long, good history of uh, really uh, encouraging uh, women in office. And so I think it was a, a matter of it, it just takes some time. Because, of course, usually people, whether they're men or women, who get to the House and the Senate in Kansas has had some prior governmental experience. Mm -hmm. That meant that once the idea of women in office began to grow, um, those women had to get some prior governmental experience and then go to, the, and we'll see the same thing happening in Congress, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, before too long. I. Um, you mean it'll work its way from the I state level? So. Up to the I year. think so. That's See, awesome. I think at least half of the people who came into Congress in my freshman class uh, had had served in a state house or state senate. Oh, really? So it's a matter of timing. But mm -hmm. I remember it was really funny. See, when I first got there, I was the only woman in the house, but I in the senate. But I think there were four in the house. Mm -hmm. And then, and the year before that, there had been two in the house. So it went from two to four. The next year, there were eight. Mm -hmm. I mean, two years later, there were eight. And two years later, there were 16. Now, all this time, the men had been saying, that's great. We're glad to have them here. They give a new dimension. It's a new point of view. We're glad to have them here. But then they saw them doubling every year. <laughs> Two, four, six, eight, sixteen, and they said, "Now wait a minute, thirty-two. That might, you know." But then it did stabilize right about then, and I think in the next election there were twenty elected mm -hmm. in the House, and I was still the only woman in the Senate. But then, I think a couple of years later, uh, when Nancy was uh, uh, Nancy was not first elected, she followed her husband. Mm -hmm. um, in the middle of a session, but then she ran again uh, a year later, two mm -hmm. years later, and won by a substantial majority. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. That it's uh, why would Kansas be more accepting? Do you think of this? Have I think it. I think it has. I I have no idea, but I think it has something to do with common sense, <laughs> <laughs> and and Midwest common sense. And then I think it also, uh, if you if you want to look for some kind of a historical basis for it, <coughs> to go back um, in uh, to prairie times when you know there there just weren't that many people, mm -hmm. and uh, women really worked side by side with mm -hmm. their husbands, and and sometimes uh, you know their work was was just as important and just as difficult as what the men were doing, and it I think. Uh, maybe led to just a little more of a partnership feeling. Mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. Sarah's going to ask you some questions about your background now. Um, we're interested in the personal dimension, both in terms of your birth family, the family you came out mm -hmm. of, and how in the world you, as a man, would have to made all of this work, the responsibilities of being in, in the mm -hmm. state legislature with a family. Um, could you tell us a little bit? I know you were born near Nebraska, uh -huh. and you said already that your father was a newspaper publisher mm -hmm. and your mother was a very active homemaker. Do you see anything in your family background that gave you something that made you run for office before most women were? What do you see mm -hmm. in your family background? I think my, it was the encouragement of my parents, really. I, I came from a family that um, just thought it was 
very important to make your contribution to the community. And um, and then I came along at a time when it seemed right to me. I, I was very early, because I think when I was first elected to the city council, there were no other women being elected in Johnson mm -hmm. County, except I think there had been a couple on school boards here. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, you know, just unusual, a, a yeah. totally un phenomenon, unusual phenomenon. But I was very early, and I do think that my parents had a lot to do with it. Now, you were born in 1928. Yes. Um, were you the only child? No. Uh, I have a brother who is about two years older than mm -hmm. I am. And he is now um, a vascular surgeon in California. Oh, my goodness. Um, how did you manage being married, having children, and being in the state legislature? Well, it, it was very difficult, um, and I have always said that it it's very doable. If everyone in the family wants it to work, it works. And if even one person doesn't want it to work, they can raise enough dust so that it won't work. <laughs> and, and fortunately, uh, my family all wanted it to work. So, I mean, my husband was beyond encouraging. I mean, he just was... Uh, go for it, you know, he was very encouraging about it. Um, my my children always enjoyed the work I was doing, you know, they... <laughs> and another factor was the timing. See, I, I stayed home um, with my children, but was very active in the community um, when my children were in grade school. Mm -hmm. um, before they went to school and during their grade school years. I was in the League of Women Voters and United Community Services, all those organizations supporting the community college, um, uh, all of those different groups that I worked with was when they were in the grade school years. And then when they were in junior high, um, I was on the city council, uh, junior high and early high school years, and when I was elected to the Senate, my, the state Senate, my daughter was in her first year of college, mm -hmm. and my son was a junior, and he in high school. In high school. And he played basketball. Mm -hmm. And I have often said that um, the fact that Phil played basketball made it possible for me to come to the Kansas Senate <laughs> because he had, he had basketball <laughs> practice every day. And he would get home from basketball practice about 6.30, and that's about the same time my husband walked in the door from work. And so then they would decide whether they were going to stay home and cook or go out to dinner. Or, and, and, and they got really very close during that time mm -hmm. period. So that was kind of a nice spinoff. Um, I would stop on my way home. If, Val was my, if my daughter was coming home for the weekend, I'd stop in Lawrence and pick her up and bring her home. So it, by that time, if, you're, if your children are good students and you have no special problem with them, uh, y you can plan to go to the Kansas Senate without a great degree of difficulty. Um, my kids were both very good students very self-motivated. I never had to say, go study, you mm -hmm. know. And um, mm -hmm. so it, it worked out well. Now, did you live in Topeka during the week and go home I, at weekends? I used to go over Monday morning uh, and or sometimes Sunday, late Sunday, depending on how early I had to be there Monday morning, and uh, come back Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Could you have done it if you'd lived in western Kansas? Would it have worked? If you it's, had? I think it's more difficult. I, I'll tell you, I think the further you live, and so that you're, you know, you're, if you've got a lot of travel time involved, your weekends get shorter. Mm -hmm. And and so the further you live and the younger your children are, the more difficult it's going to be, whether you're a man or a woman, mm -hmm. but especially for a woman. Isn't that true? Um, to pry into your finances, I would like to go only as far as we need and you allow. Okay. Um, did your family basically then depend on your husband's income, and so you were able to to do this. So yes. Is that how you managed it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, they, um, we were, I think, what you would call um, old middle income or upper middle mm -hmm. income, and um, we uh, were able to uh, do what we did. Uh, the, 
the city council, I think, paid a hundred dollars. I no, it was three hundred dollars a month. It was thirty six hundred dollars a year for the city council, which just about paid for the gasoline <laughs> 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 that you used up on the zoning drive. So the city council uh, really um, did not uh, was not where I got there. I think the Kansas Senate was something that you definitely made a contribution to the community. You had to, it was a mm -hmm. considerable financial mm -hmm. sacrifice mm -hmm. that those people served. But they had uh, instituted paying expenses and salary separately, so that while um, the salary they paid in the Kansas Senate was um, low, the fact that they paid enough expenses so that you could pay for your um, food expenses and room while you were away from home and the, and the trips back and forth uh, was, it meant that you were at least not going to be out of pocket mm -hmm. doing it. Some of the men, I think, were out of pocket because they had to pay someone uh, to take their place in their position or, um, or job yes. while they were in Topeka. I was not because, of course, by that time uh, my, um, my children were substantially grown and uh, everyone who was a, around the house could throw in a load of laundry every now and then. And I did hire a woman to come in every other week to work with me and clean. And mm -hmm. so I, I don't, you know, I don't think I ever had any help from outside until like 1970. Mm. Maybe it was the la my last year or so on the city council. Um, I was spending enough time at that job. I was president of the League of Kansas Municipalities and president of the council and president of the Mid America Regional Council, kind of all at the same time. Mm. And it was. Yeah. And it was very demanding, and I finally got some help from outside. But I would think. from that point on, uh, every week or every other week, I would have some help. And we, you know, we kept going. <laughs> so, in essence, you were not employed outside the home for pay in any way that your family depended on before no. you did this. And no, you were able to that is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, would you? have any sense of the impact of being in the legislature on your life? How has your life changed by being in the Kansas legislature? Well, I think it was broadened just enormously. I mean, you just, you get so that you understand uh, so many different points of view. It was uh, probably less so for me than it is for some because I had grown up in a community of um, in what I would call a farming community of about 3,000, right on the Kansas-Nebraska line. What was the town? Superior, Nebraska. Oh, Superior, Nebraska. And it's, it's about 25 miles north um, of Mankato. Okay. And, um, and so I had grown up in a small farming community. I had gone to school uh, with uh, farm kids. I really, and my dad had some farms, and so I really did understand a little more about agriculture than if I had spent all of my life in the greater Kansas City mm -hmm. metropolitan area. But still, you don't focus on it until you have to learn about it and really make some decisions. And so I, I felt it was an enormously broadening experience for me personally, if that's what you're asking. Okay. And, um, and I don't know that I, I would have tried to run for um, Congress had I not been in the state Senate. I thought I had an understanding, I thought I had an understanding and a background of local and state government and a knowledge of some of the problems statewide mm -hmm. so that I could really make a contribution. And I'm not saying that being in a state legislature is the only background for serving in Congress. I'm saying it's the best background for serving. Hmm. That's a good point. I think. Were there any minuses? I mean, did your kids have any trouble? Um, did your husband mind a lot? Was there any <laughs> downside? <laughs> oh, yes, there's always a downside. 
<laughs> you find yourself ironing at midnight. <laughs> um, well, it um, it's it's a difficult lifestyle having uh, the woman of the household leave Monday morning and come back Friday afternoon, and uh, it was made possible by the fact that that was really only three months out of the year mm -hmm. from mid-January to mid-April, but still it's a kooky lifestyle mm -hmm. and um, it means that you're doing your marketing at odd hours and um, it, but I will say that the downside was, as far as I was concerned, was very slight. Mm -hmm. Be, but that was because my family uh, really thought it was uh, good that I was doing what I did. See, they were not only supportive, they were encouraging. So it, I had very few downsides. I'm sure there were times, <laughs> if you talked to them, they'd probably say there were times I wanted to kill her. But <laughs> You get that anyway. I needed so. it. I wasn't here, you know. But, but I will say, I think it was for me. It was about as harmonious an experience as you can imagine. But that doesn't say there weren't some difficult times. But but see, again, geography played a part. Mm -hmm. If Philip had a big basketball dinner, or Val had a school event, I could hop in my car at five o'clock be home an hour and 15 minutes later, stay for the event, uh, stay until 10 o'clock at night, get in the car, drive back to Topeka, and be back there by 11.30. It just didn't handicap me very much mm -hmm. from the things, I mean, I remember driving home for business dinners with my husband, for um, if school events for my kids. I never missed a basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Geography made it a little easier uh -huh. to deal with. I have one catch-up question I should have asked earlier. In your education, I see you got an AA from William Woods College uh -huh. and a BA from University of Nebraska. In what were you trained? Uh, at, at William Woods, I was a music major, piano and voice, and um, and I graduated cum laude, and it was a two-year school at the time. Mm -hmm. It's a four-year mm -hmm. yeah. school now. Uh, at uh, the University of Nebraska, I graduated with honors, and um, it was, I had a, um, a, I think they called it a communications major. It was radio and television and um, uh, speech and theater. It mm -hmm. was a communications major is mm -hmm. what I called it. And, um, and minors in uh, music and French. Uh -huh. And did you get married right out of college? Worked for a while? I uh, worked for about a year and a half in uh, a radio station uh, in Omaha. I had done some advertising work, of course, working with my uh, father on his newspaper. Uh -huh. And that was print uh, advertising. And I had graduated in radio, um, and my husband had worked at a radio station. We were going mm -hmm. together at the time. And so I knew I wanted to end up in advertising somehow. And uh, so I ended up working in the area of promotion at radio station KFAB, which at the time was in Omaha, Nebraska, is now in Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm. What have I left out? What do we need to ask? Well, the only thing is, were there, were there any other organizations? Now, you named a lot of civic organizations. That I worked there, there. Uh, Were there yes. any, any other organizations like Girl Scouts or well, Federated right. Women's Clubs or anything <clears throat> like that? I always worked closely with all those groups. For instance, mm -hmm. when I was, uh, especially when I was president of the League of Women Voters and when I was on the board of the Mental Health Association, we would form coalitions. And we worked with groups like uh, business and professional women, fine group mm -hmm. to work with, just outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if their members decide they're going to do something, it's an all-out effort. AAUW was a very strong mm -hmm. uh, group in the community. And then, of course, the, uh, the women's clubs just generally, whether you're talking about... Uh, well, the, prior to, though, yeah. your, your experience in public life, uh, had you been a member of anything, junior league, um, um, 
I was trying to think of, you know, I really, um, I, was, I was always active in the church, but I was never particularly active uh, in, the, in the women's clubs. Mm -hmm. And by mm -hmm. the time I was active in PTA, when my kids started grade school, never terribly active, but always supportive and mm -hmm. would take my term as room mother and all that. And, um, but then, uh, PTA met on the same night as my city council meeting. So once I, <laughs> once I became a member of the city council, I was not as active, but I always tried to do my share. I was a five-year campfire leader with my okay. daughter. And, um, you know, just, I was active in all the ways that mothers are active mm -hmm. in terms of just supporting their kids' activities. Mm -hmm. Could I get you to tell me their birthdays? Oh, sure. Uh, my daughter was born March 17, 1954, okay. and my son was born November the 2nd, 1955. Thank hmm. you. Do you know, one of the things we're trying to chase down mm -hmm. is when women began to win seats in the legislature with children still at home. And you seem to have been kind of barely at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Do you know mm -hmm. of any women before you that had children at home? No. The two that served before me in the Kansas House, mm -hmm. I think they, they had had children, uh, but they um, were both um, grown and gone, mm -hmm. and uh, one was uh, Glee Jones, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one was Nina, I can't Nina. remember her last name, Nina. Huh. Well, we'll find you. From, well, I, oh, no, 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 no. There was a third, and I should be able to say her name, too. Well, she was she from Western Kansas. From Western Kansas. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. But at any rate, uh, I think these women were of an age where they had had children and they were grown and mm -hmm. gone. They, um, well, that was Ruth, it wasn't Ruth Lazzotti. No. Then Ruth. Lazzotti and I came the same year. See, oh, that's those uh, that's two. Right. Those two women. Okay, mm -hmm. I can't remember whether Glee Jones and Nina came back. It wasn't Nina Strong. No, not. I should have brought my chart. We can look it up. Yeah, we have our list. We got charts. I, I just didn't. Know. At any rate, I can't remember whether they came back or not. But there was Ruth. Uh, Luzzati from Wichita and Ruth um, from Topeka. Wilkins. Wilkins, Wilkins from Wilkins. Topeka. And she had grown up children. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, two others uh, in the house, and I, I just can't remember back yeah. that far. Can you remember, do you have any memory of who first came with younger kids? That's okay, just uh, you know, obviously we're trying to get a sense of it. This appears to be one of the big changes. I mean, obviously, last year was amazing with all these people mm -hmm. giving birth. Mm -hmm. And when I think of change, I think mm -hmm. of that. Huge well, I do remember uh, one young woman who had a baby. Mm -hmm. I mean, she she was pregnant when she was elected. Mm -hmm. Do you know who I'm talking oh, about? Yeah, and I yeah. can't think of her name, and but she's the only one we can remember. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Denny, my husband, that's all he can remember. Yeah. Right? And he yeah. usually, you know, they know each other. Yeah. You know each yeah. other right. better when you're in the right. same house. Right. I can't think of her name. Well, I think that's, yeah. that's, I've got that's some that help. And also, Mary we, know and we're not missing, Mary, we know we're not missing anything. We should have mm -hmm. been, that there had been somebody with a two-year-old child back when. I, you know, so far as I can remember, that first group of, of four or eight mm -hmm. were all... Uh, and, you know, that has been the history, kind yes. of, of women mm -hmm. who get elected, is, yes. is they are women who um, whose children uh, are of at least high school or college mm -hmm. age, so that you find women being, men being elected for uh, office for the first time in their 30s, and frequently with women it's in their 40s, mm -hmm. maybe even mm -hmm. early 50s yes. the first time they get elected. So it, um, but I do think the children have been a factor in that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's nice to hear it. Mm -hmm. Right. Were you a debater in high school? 
um, I don't think we debated as much as we we um, spoke. You forensics, mean, sort of. Uh, forensics, kind okay. of. You know, but you you have a journalism sort yes. of background. Yes, yeah. I do have a journalism background, a very active journalism background in high school. Uh, you know, was editor of the paper and the yearbook oh, wow. and all that. But um, but mostly my journalism background comes from working in my father's newspaper office, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. which I spent a lot of time in. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other perspectives that you, you would like to contribute? Any sense of how the legislature has changed for women campaigning? Well, and one, one perspective I'd like to mention that I, it isn't exactly along that question, but uh, that I, I haven't mentioned. I've thought of, I've, I've almost mentioned it, but I talk so much when I get started talking, I kind of slip <laughs> by it. And that is the major role that women have played in in um, my being elected. Uh, you know, they they uh, have frequently been the ones who have have encouraged me first, um, and they have been very very supportive. Um, uh, all the way along, and uh, at the time when women's organizations were beginning to be, uh, I mean women's political organizations, we've always had women, mm -hmm. active women's mm -hmm. groups in Kansas. I can remember the, <laughs> the catalyst for getting me to introduce the drunk driving bill was uh, Methodist women. Really? Yes. And so uh, women have always been active and political, even before they call them political organizations. But the Women's Political Caucus and now have been active in um, Kansas, I would say, oh, I don't know, since um, late 60s, early 70s. And they have always been very supportive of me. Um, and um, so I've had, I've had encouragement from a very broad spectrum of, of women and women's groups, yes. and have been very grateful for it. As to how things have changed, I think we are beginning to be <coughs> uh, more inclusive uh, in um, all of our governing bodies. When I was first elected, there just wasn't a woman in sight around here in local government. Uh, like I say, I think may, maybe with the exception of a couple on school boards. Mm -hmm. By the time I left local government, we were beginning to get quite a few women involved. And now, uh, in the cities in Johnson County, um, we've had a woman mayor of Prairie Village, Miriam Lee Wood. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I, I mean, I hesitate to start naming them because I'll... Um, leave out some, but they've, a number of them have had women mayors, and virtually all of them have a woman or women on their city council. We have five county commissioners now, two of them are women, but a few years ago three of them were women. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when I first started on the city council, there were no women involved at all. And I thought that was very odd, and so I began working to get women on every board and commission, and that included the planning commission. Uh, mm. I think that scared some of the developers mm -hmm. to death. They thought, <laughs> they thought that women, you know, would be very anti-development. Mm -hmm. Didn't work out that way at all, of course. Women are very mm -hmm. progressive, and they may be a little more protective of this of the um, of residential areas but they they are very uh, very progressive and so by the time i left the city and the men were just very open to that they'd say hmm. oh i'd suggest a name you know like for the uh, parks and recreation commission or the um, police commission or you know mm -hmm. and i'd suggest a name and they would say that's a great idea. We just never thought about that, you know. And <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, they were, they were very open. It's just that before I got there, uh, when they would think about names, they'd think about people that they knew and had worked with in the Rotary, and you know, it. Mm -hmm. So 
as we become more inclusive, it encourages becoming mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. more. Now, aside from number, which is wonderful, does the way any of it work change when you put more women in? Does campaigning change? Does the way business is done in the legislature change? I don't, I don't think it has yet, but I think it will. And, and the reason why I say I think it will is because really, at this point in time, we don't have an awful lot of women in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's changing in the Kansas Senate. I, I had major chairmanship and vice chairmanship every single year I was there, and, and now we are getting more women in positions of leadership in the Kansas Senate and House. Major committee chairmanships and the leadership itself. Uh, in the U.S. House, we just are not at that point mm -hmm. yet. We, mm -hmm. we have 29 women in the House, uh, and we have, some, uh, we have some subcommittee chairmen, but no major full committee chairmen and no real positions of, of leadership. I think the issues that come before us uh, change a little bit when you have um, uh, women there and they're in insufficient numbers so that um, their leadership can be found. It makes think, sense. Yeah, that's what we wonder, you know. Yeah. And I think that's the bottom line question. Well, does yeah. it make a difference to have women in there? I think it does make a difference. I really do. Not that the men don't do a good job. Mm -hmm. They do do a good job. But if... <clears throat> um, you know, if we are a democracy, that means we are all represented. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be truly represented, it's nice to have um, a variety of people there. I don't mean a quota system, but mm -hmm. it's nice to have the old and <clears throat> the old and the young and men and women and all, all of our infinite variety. Mm -hmm. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Wonderful. Okay, thank you.